All right, perfect. Thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, again, everybody, I'm Eric Randall, and this is going to be part one of a two-part series on citizen broadband radio services. Uh, this first part here is going to be on the basics. And the next part is going to be a little bit more in depth. It's going to cover, you know, local and hosted solutions and cloud-based solutions, that kind of stuff to where you put all the pieces in play from what CBRS is. But today we're just going to include what Citizens Broadband Radio Services is, how it's used, who can use it, and how it's actually put into your system. And then we'll go into a brief discussion about what Wincom has to offer. So here are bullet points that I plan on hitting. You know, what is Citizens Broadband Radio Service? What frequencies are used? Who are the operators? How does Citizen Broadband Radio Service work? What is the Spectrum Access System? Who are the prof certified professional installers and what do they do? And why are they important? Uh, what are the Citizen Broadband Radio Service devices and what does Wincom have to offer as far as products go with CBRS? So we'll go ahead and get started. So CBRS is Citizens Broadband Radio Services. It is an FCC regulated frequency band. It's basically just a band. The FCC has added additional spectrum to expand the old nationwide non-exclusive band. People knew it as the NN band. And it forms a new band called CBRS. CBRS is shared spectrum in the 365 frequency band and is labeled as band 48. There are three different tiers of operators for CBRS. We'll discuss those shortly. And CBRS currently utilizes several technologies. In fixed wireless access, which is predominantly what everybody is on this phone, uh, we'll be talking about LTE and Cambium. And they are the two technologies within CBRS. So CBRS is important because it opens additional spectrum for general use. This spectrum was reserved for federal use. The FCC realized the spectrum was only being used in certain areas, so they opened it up for basically the entire nation. This frequency spectrum is great for foliage penetration and currently has a lot less interference than 5.8. CBRS could be used in mobility, fixed wireless, RTLS, IoT, and many other usage. There are other technologies too, and even more will come up in the future as this band matures. So operators, operators are the users of CBRS. In our case, a WISP is an operator. Other operators would include priority access license holders, the US Navy, the FCC, and old and end licensees. There are many other operators, but they are just a few for you guys to understand what I mean when I say operators. There are three tiers of operators that can use this band. You have your tier one users, which are incumbent operators. This includes the federal users like the FCC, government, the Navy, federal relocation services, aeronautical radio navig navigation services, fixed satellite services. They are a few of the FCC users. And you also have the old NN licensees. They are also considered a tier one. So why are the tier ones important? For the incumbent users, they paid for a license and that license expires, you know, an X number of years. When that license expires, then they have to go one to whether it's gonna be tier two or tier three. But for now, the FCC is going to hold up their license and say, you can have it. For the FCC though, with the military, naval ships use the 3.5 frequency to communicate and they use it with their radar. And that is the older military ships. So when it comes into port, you know, whether it's along the East Coast, West Coast, or the Gulf, it'll turn off, it'll start using that 3.65 frequency. So they're not always there. So we want to take advantage of using that spectrum. So they are the tier one users. The tier two users are the priority access licensees. They're called PALS for short. This is the second highest priority and is protected against the third tier of users. The PAL is an auction. 70 megahertz will be auctioned off in blocks of 10 megahertz. 
This 70 megahertz will be between 3550 and 3650. We'll talk about that here in just a second with frequencies. The au auctions are county based. In all, there are 22,631 available PAL PALs across the US with seven PALs available in each county. The first round of auctions have already taken place and netted over $354 billion. There are many more auctions to take place over the upcoming weeks and months. So lastly, we have our tier three operators. These are general authorized access. These operators can use any portion of the CBR span that is not in use by tier one or tier two operators. GAA, for short of general authorized access, is, a, is basically a free for all. It is the same thing as using the unlicensed 5.8 or 2.4 gigahertz band. So the spectrum, the frequencies, CBRS band is from 3550 megahertz to 3700. It is regarded as band 48. So the old bands were band 42 and 43. They've been put together to form band 48. The tier one operators can use any portion of this band, all of it from 3550 to 3700, whatever it needs, it can use. This section will be, tier two operators have access to 70 megahertz of the band. As discussed, it will be auctioned off. But the tier two is only from 3550 to 3650. That's 100 megahertz, but only 70 megahertz of that 100 will be auctioned off. The last tier, tier three operators, will get what's left after the auctions. This gives tier three operators at least 80 megahertz. Whatever is not sold off on PALS will also go to GAA. This could increase the amount of available spectrum for GAA to 150 megahertz. So if you're in you know, an area where there's nobody yet, you can have 150 megahertz of unlicensed frequency to use. Frequency sharing. The good part about CBRS is the fact that the frequency is shared. This allows the spectrum to use to be used to its fullest capabilities more often. CBRS now allows for the entire 150 megahertz spectrum to be in use. To be in use. Some tier one incumbents aren't always going to be using the, the frequency they have. To take advantage of this, when the tier one operators temporarily vacate their assigned frequencies, other operators will be allowed to use it. You know, as we discussed about the naval ships, when they're off the coast, they're not going to use the CBRS frequencies. They're not going to use that band. So they're going to allow other operators to hop on there and decrease the amount of interference for everyone else. Coordination is done through a spectrum access system. We'll be discussing that later. The spectrum access system listens for environmental sensing capabilities, which are sensors. Uh, these sensors will sense when a tier one operator comes into the area. The, the ESC communicates with the spectrum access system and will relocate any CBRS devices to other frequencies. That's how this sharing is done and it happens real time, it happens quickly. The spectrum access system does control this and communicates with all of the devices. So what other portion of frequency sharing do we mean when it's good for frequency? frequency sharing. When you get into GAA, there's also that aspect too. So GAA is unlicensed. The old NN licensees were nationwide licenses and they played well with each other out there. Now they communicated with each other so one didn't have too much interference from the other and they would talk about it. That's basically what they're going to continue to do with this frequency here. So the operators and GA has no protection from anyone else, but again, hopefully they'll continue to play nice. So that continues to share frequencies even in the GAA. So I, I was just talking about the spectrum access system. What is it? It's also called the SAS. The SAS is a database residing in the cloud that keeps all information for CBRS. It's that simple. So what type of information does it keep? All the CBRS devices that can be used, they're called part 96 devices. They keep all the information on the operators, the geographical locations, 
the frequencies in use, and much, much more. There are multiple vendors that manage the SaaS, and let's take a look at them. So the five vendors that coordinate the SaaS are Amdocs, Sony, Federated, Google, and Comscope. Each vendor will have different variables to consider when you decide which one you want to go with. To determine which SaaS is right for you, you should look into each one of them and figure out which one fits your needs the best. Each SaaS has a different price and each SaaS will have different tools and different views that you can look at as far as how it operates. So like one, one factor like Google, they have a propagation tool that you could use. So this is a view, a view from one of the SaaS. Uh, this view shows you a map right outside of Morganstown, West Virginia. You'll see down at the bottom there, there's a giant gray area. That is a quiet zone. I, I, put, I picked this zone out for that reason. A quiet zone is an entire area the SAS will, re well, sorry. A quiet zone is an area the SAS will reject because s some FCC field offices or government facilities are highly sensitive to interference. So if you try to operate in that area, the SAS will just reject you. You will also see on this map, lighter shades and darker shades of green. This just represents available channels. This is just a snippet of a map. And I'm pretty sure this will change when less channels are available and more channels are available. So that's basically all this map is showing you. It's just what one of the SASs look like. So how does CBRS work? CBRS uses a SAS. The SAS will know what CBRS devices are being used every because every device must be registered for use within the SAS. This information is provided by a certified professional installer, which we'll also discuss later. The SAS will use this information to determine the interference at each frequency in each location. By doing this, each SAS can provide frequencies and permission to other CBRS devices. So in the picture, we are the fixed wireless network. That's predominantly what we have on this call. Our CBRS devices, part of our fixed wireless network, will talk back to the SAS through a domain proxy. A domain proxy engages the SAS on behalf of all CBRS devices for an operator. The domain proxy resides either in the CBRS device itself or as part of the network manager for your devices. Two examples of this, for Cambium, their network manager resides on CN Maestro. For buy cells, their network manager resides in the OMC of their cloud core. The SAS checks with the ESC, if you recall, the sensors from earlier, the sensor network, to ensure tier one incumbents are not utilizing the spectrum. The ESC gives the all clear and the SAS sends out the frequency. This is a process that is frequently occurs. The ESC will report that a T1 has come into an area and then tell the SAS. Then the SAS has to remove that CBRS device and free up the allocated tier one frequency. So for tier one and tier two operators, the SAS must have a heartbeat, a ping, from that device once every seven days to maintain the frequency. Before we had local off the grid LTE networks, you can't do that anymore. You do have to communicate with them once every now and then here in the US. So certified professional installers or CPIs, they are a key part of the CBRS process. CPIs gather all the information and inputs it into the SAS. The information gathered will be on the next page. CPIs can be certified by one of any of the SAS vendors, and they can use any of the SAS vendors regardless of where that certification took place. Wincom does have two CPIs on their engineering team. CPIs are responsible for the accuracy of information placed into the SAS and held responsible for any misinformation inputted. CPIs also decide if a CBRS device needs to be registered. There are some situations where the CBRS devices does not need to be registered, like inside. The CPI certification process is all online. 
It takes about six to eight hours to, to do it correctly. And it is, when you're finished, it's done with a monitored test. The course runs about $600, and that includes the testing fee. So when I say monitored, they actually log into your device. They make sure that you don't have any notes, and they watch you as you take the test. So that's what I mean by monitored. Um, so one other thing, CPI services, we do offer those here at WinCom. So what information does the SAS need? All of that information is right up in front of you, um, and you'll see it up there. So you have your FCC ID, your CBRS device serial number, the categories, the measurement capabilities, the technology, the deployment, the heights, the longitude and latitude, and your antenna gain, azimuth, and beam width. So you see all the information up there. Not every category is required, but it would be nice to have. And the your CPIs can help you gather this information. I'll leave that up there for another second. Let everyone look over it. All right. So CBRS devices, they're also called CBSDs. So when you're looking for a CBRS device to put in your network, it has to be part 96 certified by the FCC. So CBSD part 96 means that it is ready to go into band 48. CB, CBRS has three different device types. It's going to be your category A, category B, and your EUD, which stands for end user device. Your category A can get up to a max of 30 EIRP, and it cannot go, cannot go any higher than six meters above average terrain. Your category B has a max EIRP of 50 dBm, and it can be mounted anywhere. Uh, so the EUD here, it's not what you think. You know, a lot of people are thinking that that's going to be your CPEs that you put at the side of the house. The EUDs are actually more of your handheld devices, your, your hotspots, your USB drives. So anything that we're normally dealing with in our fixed wireless world, it's going to be a category A or category B. You know, one big example of this is Cambium's uh, 450. All of their devices are Category B certified. So what does WinCom have to offer when it comes to CBRS? We will name a few, but this, but this list is ever-changing. We are constantly testing eNode Bs and CPEs in our test lab to see what products fit in and where. We have a local core and utilize manufactured network managers to have a full CBRS network within our warehouse, basically. So let's take a look at the products. So you've heard me talk about Cambium several times. Cambium has their own technology. They don't use LTE. LTE is, you know, you can change CPE with eNodeB with core. They all fit together as long as they're LTE. So Cambium is proprietary. All of the Cambium 450 series, it says will be part 96 certified. They are part 96 category B certified. Their 450M has the highest allowable EIRP and their 450 and 450I are you know, 40 and 42 dB. Cambium uses CN Maestro to communicate with the SAS. Regardless of whether your, SAS, your CN Maestro is local or cloud-based, their C to communicate with the SAS through the domain proxy, it is done through the cloud. So if you have a local CN Maestro, it is still going back to the CN Maestro in the cloud to communicate through the domain proxy. And I'll talk more about domain proxy, cloud, and network managers and core more in the next class. So buy cells. Buy cells has several eNode Bs available. They got the Nova 227, 436Q, which is a carrier aggregation or dual carrier eNode B, uh, a Nova 433, and a Nova 233. Buy cells uses LTE, and they have a local EPC, and uh, they have a local core, and they have a cloud core, and it's actually called cloud core. So regardless of using local, again, it's same thing as Cambium. It still goes through their cloud for the network management for the domain proxy to talk to the SaaS. 
buy sales is the only LTE manufacturer that we have with a cloud core and network manager. So Ericsson, Ericsson offers eNode Bs, but no CPEs, both buy sales and Cambium so far, and even Redline, they have a full plethora, your, your eNode B and, and your CPEs. Ericsson, they make one part, that, and that, that's what it is. So Ericsson does things a little bit differently. They just don't have an eNode B. They kind of have a split mount solution. At the top, they have their radio heads, and at the bottom, they have their baseband units. The baseband units are considered the eNode Bs. And then the top with the radio heads are more of a, a, a smart antenna. So they have two radio heads that are part 96 certified, and that's gonna be their 6488 and 4408. And then they have three baseband units that are part 96 certified to be eNode Bs. And that's gonna be your 6303, 6620, and 6630. Ericsson is LTE, so this is interchangeable with any CPEs out there. We'll start testing the Ericsson network to see exactly what's, what fits perfectly and where. They do not have a cloud option, but they do have plenty of hosted options to make it seem like a cloud. They also have local network management uh, for you to consider too. Another product we have, we carry for LTE and part 96 is gonna be our Redline Communications. They have their new RDL 6000 Ellipse 4G high power eNode B. Redline is LTE. They have many CPEs that they use uh, and they utilize local cores and local network managers also. So you saw the products that we have. What else can we do for you? Wincom's ultimate goal is to help make you guys successful. You know, that, that's basically why we do these webinars. You know, we want you guys to understand what you're doing out there. In addition to our industry leading portfolio, we have a very large stacked warehouse, quick response times and fast delivery. We also offer pre and post sales technical support and engineering advice. You know, I'm a regional technical manager. I do pre and post sales services all day, every day. And that's actually the part of the job I love most. When you're looking for detailed product specifications in instructions or how to use our products or even engineering advice, we can help you. You know, whatever you need, the engineering services team can help. So let's look at a couple real quick. So our engineering services can create path analysis for your point-to-point -point or point-to-multi-point -point designs. We can create propagation studies for your LTE or TV white space applications. We can create heat maps for your Wi-Fi and DAS applications. We utilize some of the industry's best tools like IVWAVE, Atoll Path Loss, and Air Magnet to give you these accurate designs. We can create bill of materials for your entire project, not just for your point-to-point, -point, but everything you need. If you need us to create a power system bill of material, we can do that. We can add in all the components needed to ensure you have everything you need. We also do solar deployment. So if you have any questions about any of that stuff, battery backups, we can do that. So another big one that that's, I think is underutilized is our pre-configuration and staging options. We have services to where we can turn up your equipment at our office to ensure it's working. We could get it up and working on the latest firmware. We could even stage it, get all your IPs in there and connect it to the other end. We can do all that and then ship it to the exact address you need to where all you got to do is hang it up and you're done. So I, I think that's huge. That's underutilized. Uh, lastly, we have our consultation and training services. We have many, many staff members that are trained on all of our products. Uh, we are we can train the trainers we are trainers so if you need consultation services whether it's remotely or on site we can do that now is a little weird with covid but we can see about what we can do to help you guys and same thing with training services whether you want training on buy cells or ericsson or cambium we could either give you that direct training or if there's something special you want like a mix and match of both we can we can make those trainings happen for you. So initiatives, Wincom, 
initiatives from Wincom to accommodate connectivity needs, there's a full list of them up there. Uh, we've been recognized by many of our vendors uh, as you know being a really good distributor. So some of those accolades are down there in the bottom right-hand corner. And that's basically it. Uh, all of my information is up on up on the screen there. If you want to contact me directly, uh, I'll be doing the next part, part two of CBRS in two weeks on 8-20-2020 at two o'clock. And I will leave this up here to finish up the screen. This is our regional map. Uh, and I think we don't have time for questions. So if you guys have any questions at all, I will I will return your questions basically. Uh, I'll get whoever's involved in the area together and, and we'll definitely get all of your questions answered. All right. So again, thank you everybody for attending this. and I look forward to seeing you in about two weeks. Eric, thank you. Um, and to all of our attendees, thanks for uh, logging in today. Um, you'll get an email tomorrow with the link in case you did not register for the 20th, um, and you can register for, right from the email. Okay, everyone stay safe. Eric, thank you, and thank you to all of our attendees. Have a great day. Thank you, Elaine.